we talk about a very basic type, which is a feedback system that is functional like this one. So the goal is to find out the transfer function between output and input. Output over here is Y, and input over here is R. So you can certainly use the method you found in your textbook and uh, simplify the, the diagram like this. But to be honest, I don't recommend that because most of the time I found it is more difficult than you just solve everything as algebra. So over here, I so showed you guys one simple trick, which is we just name this one as error. If you don't know what's going on, just name a variable somewhere. So we know that y is going to be error signal with the transfer function c and g. And the error signal is going to be r minus y. So since we know the error over here, and this is your variable, just put this one to the first equation. We're going to get everything or name in the plot diagram, which means you should be able to find out y over r equals to, you just move y to the other side, so it's going to be 1 plus cg, and the numerator is going to be cg. So this should be pretty straightforward, right? So everything, if you see, I want you to simplify the plot diagram. This is the way you should do. Any question? Second thing is, this is something single input and single output. Or you're going to find your textbook. We call this pipe CISO. But when we have a system like this, this is the most but this is the simplest one. Normally, we cannot only have a system like this because our system, we got our input, we got our length. That's my output. And certainly, I need to have feedback over here and we generate signal to my controller. So far, everything is the same as this part. But when you look at your textbook, for a feedback system, we have not only a single input. Because this is my reference, of course, if I if the output is do exactly what I want it to do, that will be perfect. However, This is a pen, and this you want this one to be like um, 600 revolution per minute. So it will generate constant uh, wind speed output, and so you feel it's cool, right? This is normally what we want to do, and let's assume this one got this feedback system. However, again, my daughter show up. And she is naughty, so she put a stick. It's dangerous. Don't do that. And put it in. What happened? Let's assume this one is soft, so it won't. This this uh this pen is not going to be, to be stopped. But it, it doesn't matter whether this is hard or it's soft. When you put this one, this stick into the revolution trajectory of the fan, what happened? you're going to slow down the speed, right? So this one over here is what? <coughs> is turbines. Okay? So every time we have disturbance, this is also one of my input. The drawback of disturbance is that we cannot model this one because it can be this one, it can be... Okay. My daughter is here comes my 
Fat cat. You can kill me. <laughs> and jump up to this one. You're going to slow down this one as well. Right? So, can you model the disturbance based on what I'm just telling you? Can you model small girl or model fat cat? No, you can't. So, the disturbance over here, we are going to treat that as unknown. However, when you draw our free body diagram, no, not free body diagram, flood diagram, we would need to consider those as our input. So, where are we going to uh, put that into our system? So, obviously, the controller generated by the knob over here is going to fit into the system, but when we try to turn this one over here, that's external input. When the cat jump up to the fan, it's an external input, but that's after my controller. Does it make sense? So where should I put it over here? Should I put it over here? Or before I get into the plane? Or the feedback? It should be before I have a signal into the plane, right? So when we are doing something like this, you look into your textbook. I think I forgot to put this part in the notes, so please be sure you put this one in the notes, okay? So, when you have a control feedback system, we have one output. However, we might have another input. This is going to be corresponding to the disturbance. So when we try to find out the output for both, when, when we try to find our output, we need to take both disturbance and reference into consideration. Does it make sense? You cannot say, okay, I just consider this one. And this one I don't consider. That is going to be just a feedback system. But you might have experience. Even, let's take this one as a thing again. So even though I don't have cat, I don't have my daughter, I don't turn on the power, but there is a strong wind blow to the fan. What happened? This one still rotates, right? So that is also your disturbance, which means the output might not be zero, even though your reference is zero. The disturbance over here is one of your input. Make sense? Everybody understand what I'm talking about? So, when we have something like this, how are we going to formulate our transfer function from inputs to my output? Here, we still name this one as my error. And uh, error still y minus r. Now, over here, it's going to be a little bit different because y this time is one. My, this, my transfer function over here, but the input is going to be disturbance plus controller multiplied by error. Okay, so in this case, we're going to have E, B plus C, Y minus R. That, therefore, I have G, D plus CG uh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake or minus 1 or and on the other side I have 1 plus CG <coughs> so my output is going to be G extra credit. I'll ask a question. Anybody who wants to answer, I'll give you extra credit. 
one point to your homework. Okay, the question is, how many transfer functions I have over here? Let me put this one. How many transfer functions I have over here? One, two, three, two. Okay, one, two, three, more. I don't care, just give me the credit. <laughs> You're honest. Yeah, there are two over here. This one over here, and this one over here. Now, I got input over here, I got input over here, and this one over here, we can call it G. Uh, G. Close loop. Uh, corresponding to input, my desired input. This is the transfer function corresponding to my disturbance. <coughs> so let's say, let me put it in this way. If my C of S is, let's say this one of S, G is this one. So my CG is straightforward, right? So the transfer functions, y equals to 1 plus, let me put this one into uh, 2. What should I put over here? Raise your hand. Nobody? What should I put over here? Two all rows as class one. Okay. Yes, I promise. It's a hundred system. I keep my promise. So as long as you have response, I'll give you a word. So when we do this one, it's going to be uh, D of S. This part over here. This time, I don't need your answer. So you got two transfer functions. One is going to be s squared plus s plus two, and this is going to be two d e of s. This one over here is going to be s squared. Oh, I'm sorry, two s plus two uh, two s. Any question? Yeah. Very straightforward, right? It just carry out all the calculations. Now, I have a question. Yeah. 
file value zero, but how? As nobody want to volunteer for the point. Okay. We use file value zero, but what is unit step? What is transfer function of unit step? One over s, right? So what is no disturbance? What is my zero? Zero. So over here, what happened? Since you know this is zero, this is one over s. This part over here is going to become since it's zero. Zero is always zero. So everything fall back to what we learned earlier. I got my YSS equals to you can uh, just put S externally and you got S squared plus S plus two two S uh, two uh, two S is five. do you call this thing? Since those systems are linear, so when I add them together, what is this specific <coughs> operation called? The superposition. Superposition. Mm -hmm. So this is superposition. Yeah. Okay, so if 
if you have a linear system, if you have a linear system and you've got inputs, but this time the input is not only desired input, you also have disturbance. In the future, we're going to talk about noise. If you have linear system, keep in mind you need to take all the inputs into consideration. Sometimes you might have more than one transfer function corresponding to individual inputs. In that case, when you try to analyze the stability, you will need to consider whether this part is stable or whether this part is stable. Okay? We're we haven't talked about the stability, but stability is going to be important when we have multiple transfer functions. Because sometimes when we design our controller, uh, this one over here, it can stabilize my plane corresponding to my input. However, it might be a disaster or it actually do something pretty bad corresponding to disturbance. So when we design the controller, you guys need to remember this, this controller may be good to the design input, but it can be pretty bad to the disturbance. In particular, why is it so bad? I'm telling you this is always what? Step input or delta function. So everything can be eased down. Is that always a good one? The answer is no. Because when you have disturbance, what kind of disturbance are you going to uh, encounter? For instance, I got the motor over here. So you know motor is going to be some kind of sine wave, right? And you are having a system, you try to stabilize the antenna. You cannot control the motor because some people decide they want to have a water pump next to the tower. Can you say no? In Taiwan, you can't. Otherwise, you get into trouble, right? So when you have a water pump next to the antenna, and you just design your controller based on, based on what we have as our unit input, I can tell you the antenna is going to have periodical signal. And because our system is from power source, you're going to see something like 60 hertz. Obviously, this kind of controller can never do the job. Does it make sense? So when you attack those kind of things into consideration, you need to separate the transfer function corresponding to your disturbance and the transfer function corresponding to your reference. They need to be separate. And as long as they are linear system, you can add them together using superposition. Does that make sense? Okay, let's pretty much cover whatever we have in uh, test. Okay, so I lied because I told you that last time I, I'm going to cover certain parts, but after I design a problem, there's one thing I add. You need to understand poles, zeros, and uh, uh, transfer function gain, which is something we talked about last time. So when you have something like this over here, can you find out the pole? This is a second order equation, you should be able to find out the pole, right? Again, uh, the zero is going to be a root of the numerator. The pole is going to be the, numerator, uh, the, the roots of the uh, denominator. So you need to know those kind of definitions, okay? And what is a transfer function again? Those things are not difficult, but you need to know what the definition are going to look like. Okay? I think in the test, I won't give you guys 
the problem so complex? It should be simpler. So if you want to try it, solve that at home, because I think I need you to at least use 20 to 25 minutes to solve this one on the board. So I don't want to waste my time, since yeah. it's just like algebra. So if you want to solve this one and you, and you need to know the answer, let me know. I'll give you the answer. Okay. Uh, part B of the uh, example. We're going to start another topic, which is dynamic response. <coughs> Before we move up, what do we learn so far? We know we are given a mechanical system. We need to control this guy. What do I need to do to uh, understand what's going on and how do we uh, process this system? So the first thing when we see a mechanical system, we do what? Model, right? When I say modeling, there are two things you need to know. One is what? Equation of motions, which is the homework you did this time. And after you have equation of motions, you need to use Laplace transform to get transfer function. And after you get transfer function, depending how you're going to put, because you might have more than one mechanical system, so you need to put everything as what I do. And the goal is to find the relationship between output and input. Then we start to design what we want to do over here. But before we design our controller, there is one thing important you need to know, which is what is the dynamic response of my transfer function. Because if you give a step input, there are a few possible responses. Let's say there is a wheel and I give it a hit, it will start to spin. But when it starts to spin, this guy over here, so this one over here has a rotational spring, has a rotational damper. So I give a torque like this. What happened? There are a few possible things. One, you cannot move it because your force is not big enough. Secondly, you might you give up a, a force. Then this one over here is going to gradually approach to a final destination. Or because you got spring, you got the you got uh, damper over here, so chances that you might have something like even though it goes to uh, zeta, but it will spin over here back and forth until you uh, achieve this steady state. So those things are possible results. One, you don't, you cannot move it at all. You might have this kind of trans transient response. You might have this kind of transient response, even though we can calculate what's going on eventually. But transient response, sometimes it's going to be important to us. I, what I think I used for example before, if this, this, comp, uh, this system is used for surgery, you know surgery, the robot, use an eye. So you've got patients, and you want to open the chest. And if you have this response, it's okay because your your knife is going to approach this one quickly. 
but if your controller is designed badly, it doing something like this, your your knife is like <laughs> we we know it's not going to be good, right? So we need to analyze the transient response based on this response or the, this response. Normally, what do we want to do? We want to have everything to be fast. Okay, so we hope it will go to this one directly within maybe 0.1 second. Then it will stop right here. So we also want to have no oscillation. This is pretty bad, right? But before we can say we want to have this one to be fast, to have no os oscillation, when we design our controller, we need, need to know what is the transient response of my plane. Okay? And when we are dealing with the transient uh, transfer function, we also explain that all the transfer functions, all the polynomials, Are combinations of first order and second order systems. What does this mean? It means that I got my G. This can be three as you want. And G1, G2, G3, they are all either first order or second order system. So when I say this, I'm telling you, you don't need to worry about anything like higher order, like seventh order, tenth order, twelfth order, even though it's very likely. You can just decouple everything into first order and second order and deal with the individual systems one by one. Once you take care of the, the individual ones, then you don't need to worry about the, 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 the overall like 13, 20, or 100 orders. It doesn't really matter. Does that make sense? So the important thing is we need to understand what is the first order system going to look like, what is the second order system going to look like. Let's talk about first order system. Okay, we are having our transfer function as numerator over denominator. And when we are dealing with something like this, normally we do not want to have S on top of this one because if you have S on top of this one, you can separate that into two individual ones. Normally, we are trying to have the first order system <coughs> look like one P S plus one. Okay? So when you have something like this, there is a reason we want to have one in the numerator as a co coefficient, and we have one over here as my coefficient. If I use final value theorem for a step response of this one, what is the result? One, right? One. So that's a reason we always want, when we de describe our transfer function for a first, first order system, we always want to have something like this. And the T over here is a very important name you hear all the time. This is going to be high constant. This is important because you're going to hear this from now on. If you want to do graduate school, this is always something you need to know in either control or vibration. High constant is a very important index you will need to know for both first order and second order systems. Okay. If you do something like this and you take inverse of our transform, you 
we're going to have like this. What does this mean? If my this one smaller than zero, is this going to be divergent or convergent? Smaller than one, which means this part is going to be positive. When this is positive, what happens? you're going to find example. So when you have the P greater than zero or smaller than zero, you're going to find out if you plot that into time domain. Either you're going to have a constant response or you're going to be divergent. In your notes. It's going to look like this, which means the pole. This is my pole. If my pole is negative, my system is going to be stable. If my pole over here is positive, my system is going to be unstable. Make sense? So, when we are dealing with those kind of stuff, you're going to see another plot all the time in control theory. That is this one. This is real. S. Imaginary S. The reason we have real part and imaginary part is because if we have a second order system, we need to consider the ima imaginary part since all the poles are complex numbers. But the real part of your pole, just like this one and this one, if you are having things on this side, that's unstable. When we say unstable, it is because when I put my input into the system, it's going to diverge. Though, when we diverge physically, we cannot have it diverge to infinity because my power is limited. However, we still consider that as unstable. But if my pole is smaller than zero, which is on your left hand side, this side over here is going to be stable. Even though they are on this axis, we still consider it's stable, critically stable. We're going to talk about that later. But as long as it's over this side, we call our system stable. Okay, that's the reason when you are dealing with the transfer function, when, uh, when you start to design your controller, the transfer function between output and input, output and disturbance, you need to be careful because if your pole 
after you up, uh, calculate for the transfer function, you find out the pole is going to be on this side, your system is not going to be stable. And you need to guarantee everything is going to be on this side. So your system is going to be stable. Does it make sense? I got to first order system. So now, since we explain on the other side, you know those two are going to be what? Stable or unstable? Stable. Stable, okay. So they are going to be stable. And without doing any calculation, by looking at this one over here, what is my steady state response? Final value of zero. One. one, right? Because the coefficient is going to be one, and S is going to be zero. So this is going to be one, this is going to be one. Those are important because control theory, final value theory is a very important thing. And if you want to do PhD in the future, this will be in the qualified exam a lot of times. So I know it's going to be one. Now my question is, Clearly, the response I'm drawing over here is what? First order approximation. If I give you one line like this, and you need to make a guess, which is what? Which is G1? Which is G2? The question I have is, which one is faster? G2? One is faster, G2 or G1. This one. seconds, this one got two seconds. So obviously it's going to be faster. When I say faster, we would need to know what is the definition <coughs> of time constant. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So
this is in your textbook. Uh, no, I think your textbook doesn't have this one for some reason, I don't know. But I think this is important. And this part over this part I'm going to explain over here is not only important for control, it's also important for measurement. So when you've got This is going to be the approximation. The time constant over here is if you turn on the power, after one time constant, your, your <coughs> output is going to be 63.2% of your final value. If you wait for two time constants, you will become 88%. If you have three time constants, is about 95 percent. If you have four time constant, this is about 98 percent. If you have five time constant, this is about 99 percent. Why is this important? Because I am asking you, I'm a boss and you're my engineer, and I'm asking you, okay, engineering one, if you, I turn on the power, can you tell me after how much time I can start to get my measurement 